Welcome back. Now that we've discussed Lebanon, let's see what are the ramifications for the rest of the region. When Lebanese political leaders reached agreement in Doha last month, it heralded a new era, not just in Lebanon, but also in the region. It proved that the Arab world was capable of resolving its own problems. This time, it was the Qataris taking the lead. They are doers. They're not, uh, they don't like to talk as many leaders, as many Arab leaders do all the time. And they came with a specific goal and they just uh, would not allow them to leave Doha without achieving this goal. Suddenly, dialogue seems to be the word on everyone's lips. And even the unlikeliest of partners, Syria and Israel, are now willing to sit down and discuss their problems, albeit with Turkish mediators. The balance of power on the ground has shifted away from those that, that serve U.S. interests and the proxies of the United States to those that serve the interests of, of the, the opposition, including Iran and Iran's allies in the region. America is no longer seen as an honest broker. In furtherance of the goal of two states, Israel... U.S.-sponsored peace is being increasingly viewed as merely a way for the Bush administration to force its will on Arab states. The United States over the last five, six years, since September 11 and since the occupation of Iraq, has been couching things in the Middle East uh, very divisively. That the U.S. says you're either with the U.S. or you're against the U.S. You're either axis of evil or you're, or you're a good moderate. With so many resources tied up in Iraq, the Bush administration is rapidly losing strategic leverage and credibility in the region. Regional players stepped in to fill the diplomatic void. And as negotiations between Israel and Syria continue, peace talks between Israel and Lebanon are now also on the cards. This would mean that Hezbollah as an armed fighting group against Israel would either have to sign peace with Israel as part of the Lebanese government and would have to move very rapidly toward disarmament. Uh, and hence, uh, Iran would lose Hezbollah as a major force in the region. It would also mean Hamas would be very impacted. Rival Palestinian factions Hamas and Fatah agreed to begin negotiations despite earlier categorical refusals. There is no dialogue with those murderous terrorists. I'm calling for a comprehensive national dialogue to implement the Yemeni initiative, as endorsed by the Arab summit. It was a spectacular turnaround. And with a truce declared between Israel and Hamas, brokered by Egypt, it seems diplomacy is the new way forward. Who knows, maybe even the most intractable issue in the region, Palestine, could be next. Still with me in the studio is uh, Professor Mona Makramabed and uh, Daily Star editor, Mr. Jamil Mrouwe. And joining me from Paris is Ambassador Nassif Hitti, the Arab League ambassador in Paris, and uh, David Mack, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs. Welcome to you all, gentlemen, and Madame Abed. I would like to start with you. Okay. It sounds as if there is a rash of direct and indirect talks in the Middle East today. A flurry of negotiations. That's right. Already we have, as we heard in the, in the, in the, in the report, Syria is talking to Israel directly through Turkey. Right. Hezbollah apparently is talking with the Israel through Berlin. Hamas is talking with Israel through Egypt. And apparently Hamas and Fatih will be talking internally in Palestine. It seems this is a good thing happening. Apparently Lebanon is triggering something good or has, has already been triggered by that? Lebanon is, was the catalyst, let's say, of something that was brewing. But the other thing that is in the background, and we should not forget, is the um, everybody wants to get away from American involvement. And now is the right time. There is a certain revulsion of this particular administration and the Middle East, the Middle East leaders, want to show the next president that if there is proper engagement, if there is a certain commitment on their part, then there could be practical solutions. 
So the, the failure of the past years does not mean that it is the Arab world that has failed, but that it is the ineptitude of the American administration that has caused, and the, you know, the blunders yeah. of the Bush administration, the heavy-handed manner in, uh, to treat all these very sensitive issues. We, so they are showing the world that leaders of the Arab world can come together and don't forget that there is internal pressure. Internal pressure comes pressure. from the youthful population today, which is sick and tired of everything that is happening. They are watching the West, they are watching East Asia, they're watching the advances. They want to have the same thing. Where is Syria and Lebanon heading to in terms of their relationship that are tense for the time being? Lebanon's leaders, whether they are pro-Syrian, or anti-Syrian need to recognize that they've got now the opportunity to form Lebanon, to, to restructure Lebanon. Why can't Lebanon talk to Syria, at least Jamil, like Israel is talking to, or like the Palestinians who are under occupation are talking to Israel? Yes, but the you know, Israeli influence uh, is not comparable um, but can one say that the Gulf is immune to the influence of the Iranians or the Saudis? Can one say that Mexico can turn its back to America and so on? It's the osmosis, the permeability. And uh, Syria's uh, permeability uh, and our permeability with Syria has been more to the advantage of the Syrians, where they have been, if you like, more aggressive. The Ambassador Hetty in Paris uh, you must be celebrating the success of the Arab League efforts in Doha. Uh, why isn't the Arab League getting involved more in ameliorating Arab, Arab relations and maybe starting with Syria and Lebanon? Doha succeeded because Doha could not fail. The cost would have been very high uh, to carry for either faction in Lebanon and for either factions outside uh, Lebanon. There is a feeling, and it's a confirmed feeling, that power does not translate into influence, regardless of how strong the power. And there is also the feeling of a balance of vulnerabilities in the region, that nobody could push beyond a certain point. These factors together created a certain relaxation of tension in the region among the key actors, the key mm -hmm. regional, international, and uh, uh, Arab actors, and allowed for really this success with the Lebanese package deal, which was impossible before. Let me take this to, uh, uh, to Mr. Mack in Washington. Uh, as we heard uh, from our colleagues here in the studio, uh, that, in fact, uh, the, the logical force has failed. And if you notice, America, probably the most visible power in the region, is absent from the most visible talks in the region. Marwan, I've just about given up on the Bush administration actually learning anything from the history of the last seven years. Uh, certainly, I think it's too late for the president himself. On the other hand, uh, if you look at what's happened, I think it's been some good lessons for everybody. Uh, invasions do not solve complicated strategic problems. The U.S. invasion of Iraq didn't do it. Israel's invasion uh, of Lebanon in the summer of 2006 didn't do it. What, what's the alternative for Washington? The alternative is negotiations. The United States actually opposed uh, a number of these moves toward negotiation. The U.S. was stopping the Lebanese government from negotiating. And this is what, part of the impasse to, to which they have arrived. I, I want to take you to Egypt, to yeah, Cairo, where right. you're coming from. Yeah. How do you foresee Egypt taking a more leading role? Absolutely. Egypt has always been a pace setter for po po politics in the Middle East. Uh, its role has not been so obvious lately, but I think this is the accumulation of sustainable efforts. We must, not rem we must remember this, that it has not come overnight. Th these are sustainable efforts that have been going on between Hamas and, be and, and, and Israel, between Hamas and Fatah. How do you see the region moving forward in a more positive manner towards implementing uh, these talks that are taking place? Undoubtedly, if, uh, if the heavy-handedness of the Bush administration is absent from the scene as it is now in its sunset, uh, undoubtedly, 
those complications that we have seen for the past eight years, ensuing of 9-11 and the reaction to 9-11, will be dealt with more competently. The key problem, to comment uh, very briefly on the past years, has been too much American presence, exclusive presence in the Gulf, and too little and almost absent American diplomatic presence on the Mediterranean shore, meaning that trying to suspend, to shelve the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Palestinian issue, not to make it an issue, an important issue. And this has created all this damage. Mr. Mack, in Washington, I just need to, to clarify something. Yes. It's probably impossible to oh, have I, any... I want to be able to respond. Go ahead, please, go ahead. Um, the problem, in my view, is not that there has been too much U.S. presence in the Gulf or anywhere else. The problem is that the U.S. presence has been terribly unbalanced. It's been heavily military. There has been very little attention paid uh, to uh, diplomacy. The whole focus has been on a unilateral military approach with people expected to follow in and, and, and come into line with the United States in the wake of that. And that's not the way realities work in the 21st century. Mr. Mack, hold on to that thought, and we'll be right back after the break to discuss American and French role in the Middle East.